Hey guys, what's up from Pokemon Classics? Reminding you that the classics never go out of style. Hey, today we're gonna be taking a look at one of my favorite sets from the Wizards of the Coast era. This is the first edition Gym Challenge set. Some of the best artwork, bar none. I've actually managed to collect this set in PSA 10, and I think I was one of the first holo collectors to do that, just shortly behind Gem Mint Pokemon. So shout out to Zach. He's a great collector and you know, he's, he's on top for a reason. That dude is legit. Anyway, let's jump into these cards and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the price data, some of the population report. Hopefully this will be informative, but also an opportunity for me to share some of my collection with all of you. So we're going to start out with one of my favorite cards from the set. And I know this is a lot of people's favorite, Blaine's Arcanine. So now this card was unique in that it was the first to feature an attack damage over 100. And I know that's become more commonplace in modern Pokemon, but back in the day, this was entirely unheard of. It's just a beautiful card. Pretty desirable card too, even in PSA 9 and PSA 8. It's one of those cards that a lot of people really love the artwork on. All right, so it looks like there's 139 PSA 10 copies, which definitely isn't the lowest pop in the set, um, but it's, it's not a very high population, if we're being honest. If we're looking at uh, some of the cards in base set or fossil set, one of the trends that we're seeing in the market right now is a lot of correction for some of the lower value grades, the PSA 9s, the PSA 8s. Um, and so it's not uncommon for looking at our price chart to bounce back and forth a little bit, and that's normal, that's healthy, that's just a supply and demand. But we're definitely seeing this major growth here going into the end of October and into November, so that's interesting. Uh, the PSA 9 is doing really well too. Looking like the last couple sales were in the $800 to $900 range. You know, there's a little bit of retrace from earlier. Back at the end of October, it was looking like uh, $1,000. I think, I think those prices are pretty strong though, all things considered, even if there is a bit of a retrace. So next up we have PSA 10 Blaine's Charizard. Now this was the third Charizard released from Wizards of the Coast. First one was base set Charizard, which had a couple different variations from Unlimited, first edition, base set two. Still the same artwork though. From there, uh, I believe it was dark Charizard next. And then we didn't get another Charizard card until Gym Challenge. Again, this is just a beautiful card. We don't even have a dot of edgeware on the back. It's just an awesome card. I'm really fortunate to have this one. I graded this one myself. In fact, as we're going through the set, you'll notice they're all the old school wizards, not wizards, the old school PSA labels um, from years ago. And I've been at this for a really long time. So here we go, Charizard. So it looks like there's 306 PSA 10 copies and 530 PSA 9. So that would make sense. I mean, it's definitely one of the most popular cards in Pokemon, really one of the most popular in the set, definitely the most popular character, Charizard. Pretty stable prices in earlier 2020 at around $5,000 for Charizard and really just blew up October, November, still going up. It's like the last price was $10,293. Yeah, PSA 9 is looking like a little retrace there. I can't verify all these auction uh, final prices and the data points. It looks like between $2,500 and maybe $3,500. PSA 10, though, looking pretty strong. Um, again, it's a highly desirable card. I feel like you can't really go wrong with Charizard. Um, it's always going to at least have some level of desirability because there are so many collectors out there that are looking to capitalize on nostalgia, and Charizard is one of those cards that come to mind. You, know, you think back to times in school, out on the playground, showing off the binders, showing off cards, Charizard was the guy. That's the one that people wanted to have and that earned you respect out on the schoolyard. Card number three, we have Brock's Ninetales. Now, just from personal experience, I can tell you that this card is not the most difficult card to grade in the set. Still pretty cool. It's got a really dark background, and I think that's what helps it out with grading, is that uh, the light hollows usually show surface scratching much easier than the darker hollow backgrounds. Still a really nice card. And in fact, if we look that one up on Pokemon Price, I think we're going to find something interesting. 
Yeah, so this is what I'm talking about. The uh, pop report for PSA 10 is actually higher than the pop report for PSA 9, signaling how much easier this card is to grade than the vast majority of cards in the set. It's pretty impressive. Still, sales data is pretty strong on the 10s. I mean, it's nowhere near the price of our first two cards, but if you consider PSA 10s, it's not doing too bad, especially over where it was just a year ago, down in the $100 range, now up to like $700. That's strong growth. Card number four is another one that I know a lot of people really like, and it's a tough one to grade. That's Erica's Venusaur. You can't go wrong with the big three, Blastoise, Venusaur, Charizard. And this one is just beautiful. This is actually from my very first grading submission. A lot of these cards are when I was new to grading, when I first got registered with PSA. And I was hopeful for nines on a lot of cards. Um, and I was fortunate enough that they were good enough condition to earn tens. I will say though, I'm a little bit disappointed in the set when it came out because it had a Charizard, it had a Venusaur, Blastoise is one of my favorite Pokemon and to have him left out, I just did Blastoise dirty. He deserved better than that. 85 copies, so definitely a lower population. In fact, if we look at our graph, I think this is a trend that you guys are going to see with a lot of these low pop, high desirable cards is that, that growth scale, that, that linear curve, maybe even a little bit exponential here at the end going from those previous two sales. But over time, as these cards get scooped up by collectors that put them into their sets that aren't interested in selling them, you're not going to find a whole lot on the market. In fact, we've got two that sold over the course of months. There's not a lot of data points there. And so scarcity is one of the things I tried to outline in my previous video. Scarcity is one of those major factors that control the market. And condition and scarcity can go hand in hand. The better the condition, the more scarce the item is going to be and the harder it's going to be to attain for your collection, more competition. Next up, we have Giovanni, the boss himself. This is his Gyarados. There's actually two Gyaradoses in this set, which is kind of unusual. I wouldn't have expected them to double up on that Pokemon. Definitely a crowd favorite, though. I know there's a lot of people that are uh, big into Gyarados. Really cool card here. Yeah, these... These older, older labels are definitely giving me some nostalgia. Continuing with Giovanni, we have Giovanni's Machamp. I really like the uh, artwork on the Gym Challenge set. The cards are, the characters in the cards are so aggressive. A lot of them are in attack um, stance, especially Machamp here. He's just like jumping right off the card at you. By the way, these perfect fit sleeves are my number one recommendation for PSA cards because you don't really even tell that it's in a sleeve, but you know there's definitely a sleeve there. Um, check those out on eBay. I think they're still sold there. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was a fellow member of the E4 forum that actually produces and sells those sleeves. I could be wrong about that, but they are just they're perfect. That's why they're called perfect fit, I suppose. Next up, we got Giovanni's Nidoking. Now, this isn't one of the more popular cards in the set, but I really like it. Nidoking is one of my favorite Pokemon, and uh, prior to this, I believe the only one that was released was in base set, which was actually one of the first cards that I got. Um, Giovanni's Nidoking, I always liked more. It's a more intimidating attack pose. It's Giovanni. You even see Giovanni's Nidoking. Or I'm sorry, it's Gary's Nidoking fighting against Giovanni in the anime uh, when he had Mewtwo. And so that's something that I always think about as well. Next up is one of the heavy hitters in the set, Giovanni's Persian. Now out of all of the cards in the set, this is one of the most difficult to grade. And so it demands a premium because a lot of set collectors need this card to finish their set. I actually graded two of these personally. Um, we'll take a look at the population report in a second, but there are so much holofoil exposed and it's all white that it makes it really susceptible to print lines, surface scratches. You can see this one is just flawless. Take a look at the back. Again, really nice card. One of those cards that's difficult to acquire. But if you're a set collector and you're working on finishing it, that's one of the ones you've got to check off your list at some point. So it's probably going to cost a bit. 
Let's take a look at the population report on uh, the Persian. Yeah, so looking like a population of 53. Imagine that. Think of how many people are out there in the world of Pokemon, collecting, building up their personal displays, trying to finish sets. 53 is not a very big number. We're in the double digits. So that's gonna make this card very difficult to find, especially when you look at the number of PSA 9 copies. With over 300, that signals to me that this card is very hard to grade. And so you could probably be relatively sure that there's not gonna be a massive influx affecting the population in the near future. Looking at prices, in my mind, that's a perfect recipe for demand, driving prices further as life goes on. And we definitely see that with the PSA 10s. Not a lot of data points on there for PSA 10 either. Look how far back we have to go. There's nothing. So in fact, this PSA 10 price was from May. I'm guessing the price is probably gonna be worth a lot more than that. It's hard to say. Ultimately, price is determined by whatever somebody's willing to pay. So I don't want to speculate about it too much. Um, but you know, all the factors, all the market conditions, I think are right to drive prices for something like that. Next up, we have another low population card, and this one's not the most popular card out there. Koga's Beedrill. Do you remember back to base set, Beedrill was only a rare? And it was actually a pretty good rare too. Like it was one that I would definitely take over a computer search or an item finder or any of those other trainers, Pokemon breeder. I know Pokey Rev has got his share of Imposter Professor Oaks in his last couple uh, booster pack openings. Really cool card though, a lot of holographic area exposed, so definitely susceptible to scratching on this one as well. And again, it's one of those pieces that any set collector is going to need to finish their set. Next up, we have one of the easier cards to grade, Koga's Ditto. Now, I always thought D Ditto was one of the coolest Pokemon in the original uh, series. Could transform into any other any other Pokemon, could take over their attacks. I really like the 3D variation though of the fossil Ditto. This one I think is a little more cartoony, a little more cheesy. There's not a lot of holofoil area, so it's not my favorite. But again, it's one of the cards in the set and it deserves some level of respect, even though it's not, not on par with some of the other ones. Making our way into the second half, we have the second iteration of Raichu. First Raichu is from base set, and I actually have a video about Raichu. Raichu was the first card that I ever got. It was my most, my most valuable card, and I say that from like a nostalgia standpoint. What a weird attack name, Kurzap. So Lieutenant Surge, in the anime, he had a Raichu. Pikachu thought about evolving to take on Raichu and decided not to evolve. So in that way, this card is kind of iconic because of its connection to the anime. Definitely a cool card. Next up, we have one of the most expensive and hard to find cards in the set, Misty's Gold Duck. This card is extremely difficult to grade. And I know if you think about uh, Misty's Psyduck from the anime, never really saw Misty with a Gold Duck, but this card, this is a tough one to find. Now I actually graded two of these as well over all of the years. One I kept in my personal collection, which is this one. The other one I sold years and years ago, I think for like $400. Seems like a mistake now in retrospect, but you know, that's just what the market was at the time. It was a fair price. I don't necessarily regret it. Yeah, so this one has a population of 53. Again, one of the lowest pop cards in the set, making it highly desirable. You can check out our graph again for PSA 10s. $1,000 a year ago. Where are we at now? It's like the last sold copy was $5,000. A couple before that were in the 3,500 range. And again, that makes perfect sense to me. You've got a PSA 9 population of 352, vastly outweighing by a scale of 7 to 1, just showing how difficult this card is to grade. Here's our second Gyarados in the set. This is Misty's Gyarados. Between the two, personally, I like Giovanni's Gyarados better, but Tidal Wave for 70 damage, that sounds like a Gyarados type of move. He would cause a Tidal Wave for sure. Next up, we have another really iconic card from the set, Rocket's Mewtwo. 
Now I'll give you guys a chance to figure out what's unique about this card. You probably figured it out. Rocket's Mewtwo was the very first card to feature three different attacks. And I know this triggers some people's OCD because the uh, character box, the uh, illustration is smaller than the other cards. They had to make room for that, for that third attack. But I remember when this card came out, it was one that was playable. It was one that a lot of people really liked just because of the iconic nature of that third attack. And who doesn't like Mewtwo? Mewtwo is a really amazing Pokemon. In fact, you play the Game Boy games, that's kind of the main goal at the end is finish out your collection. You need to find Mewtwo. He's the big bad. So, awesome card. Let's take a look and see what Mewtwo is doing these days. All right, so with 191 PSA 10 copies, definitely not the same level of scarcity as some of the other ones that we've seen. Still though, we see a pretty strong demand in the price data in PSA 10. It looked like it was kind of hanging around $800 for quite a while before jumping up to $2,000. I'm expecting we'll probably see a little bit of a retrace on that just because of how many available copies there are. But, um. Yeah, I mean, looks like there was a trend there. 1,600, 1,700, 2,000. PSA 9 settling in at about $600. It's a really cool card, and if you buy what you like, if you buy what you love, what you're interested in, ultimately, there's not a good deal or a bad deal to be made there. It's all about what's, what's right for you as a collector. Let's check out another Rockets Pokemon, Rockets Zapdos. This one I loved growing up. I actually used this card uh, pretty savagely in a deck when I used to compete. Um, that plasma attack for one energy does some damage, allows you to get some energies attached to Zapdos, power them up right away. Uh, what's, what's bad about that? This one brings back a lot of memories. Like I said, I use this in a deck. It's awesome. Next up we have Sabrina's Alakazam. If you guys remember from the anime, Sabrina defeated Ash with Kadabra, and Ash had to go enlist the help of some ghost Pokemon and Haunter. Uh, this is Sabrina's Alakazam. Now I believe Alakazam was the one that you could get from Sabrina's starter deck. However, it didn't come in the first, first edition variant, that one you had to get from booster pack. He's wielding the spoons. You guys know this about me if you've seen some of my other videos, but Alakazam, by far my favorite Pokemon. A little bit off-center on the backside. Never really noticed that before, top to bottom. They do give you a little bit more uh, leeway on the backside of the card for centering than on the front side. And you know, that's one of the pieces of advice that I would give is the better you can get to know PSA's grading standards, the better you put yourself in a situation to understand condition, price, uh, the market, We've got Blaine. Next, we've got Giovanni. That was one of the other cool things about the gym sets is they featured the gym leaders and each one got their own holo card. And I know the ones in gym challenge are a lot easier to grade than the ones in gym heroes. Um, still, I think that's a cool feature to add into the set is actually featuring each of those gym leaders giving them their own holographic card. I you know sometimes there's not a lot of love for trainer cards and uh, not many trainer holographics out there. I think there were a couple in uh, Team Rocket set prior to this, but they deserve some love. Got Koga. And my favorite of them is Sabrina. She's got her badge there, levitating it with her psychic powers. That's card number 20. So 20 holographics from this set. Again, very, very popular set. It's one of my personal favorites. I love all of the aggressive poses that they gave the gym challenge cards. Um, in gym heroes, they seem a little bit more friendly in terms of the Pokemon. Here, they seem a little more sinister. And that's one of those nice touches that I think is great for, the, for distinguishing one set from the next. All right, guys, thanks for watching this video. I'd be happy to post more of my collection in future videos and give you guys some of my tips and observations about the market. Um, hey, this is Pokemon Classics reminding you, the 
the classics never go out of style. We'll see you guys next time.